All right, everybody, welcome back. So, today we get to continue the fun part of the class. Um, just so you understand what we're doing for the next couple of classes. So, today we're gonna keep talking about lists. We're gonna look at portions of an implementation of a list. Remember last time we introduced this idea of a list. A list is a generalization of an array. A list as a data structure that, like an array, brings order to its elements, but unlike Java's built-in arrays, has some useful features. It can change size, I can add things to either side, I can add things to the middle. I can take out elements. I can get and set the way I can with a normal array, but I'm gonna add some other features on top. You guys are working on one part of an implementation of our simple list interface for the homework problem. We'll go over the other parts today in class. We'll look at some of that code together. And then we're gonna talk about a different way of implementing lists. That is going to, so the first way is kind of a nice review. There's some paired programming concepts in there, but also some interfaces. And then the second way is even more cool because it's actually gonna draw on some of the things that we learned about when we learned about objects. So we're gonna have some inner classes going on. We're gonna see use of object references in order to provide structure, add structure to data. Um, and so that's what we're doing today. On Monday, so next week, you guys have the second midterm in the CBTF, um, starting on Monday after class. So what we'll do on Monday is we'll review objects. So that'll be the day that we'll go over some problems together. You guys can ask questions, um, try to get you ready for that. And then on Wednesday, we'll come back and we'll continue with our, our work on lists. You guys will still have some homework going on next week. Um, you know, people have been pointing out, maybe the MPs are getting a little bit easier. Maybe that's okay, because the homework problem is actually gonna start getting a little harder. So, you know, don't worry. We have plenty to do uh, for the next month and a half. All right, so uh, let's review a little bit from last time, because the, 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 w one of the reasons we work with lists is it also gives us a great chance to practice our algorithm analysis skills. So this is something that we're gonna start practicing when we look at both the data structures that we start to build together and the algorithms that we're gonna build on top of them. Because as a computer scientist, as a programmer, you care about getting something to work. As a computer scientist, you care more about how it works and understanding how it works under certain conditions, under different conditions, given different inputs, under different, you know, situations. Now, how is this thing going to perform, right? That's one of the things that sets you apart from someone who can just, you know, grab some code off of Stack Overflow and integrate it into their project. It's not a bad thing to do. It's a way to get some useful work done from time to time, but you, know, you guys are studying this at one of the best institutions in the country, right? So we want you to come out of here with a leg up on your peers. Um, and this is one of the places where uh, you're gonna have that, is the ability to not just implement things, which is super useful and fun, but also understand them and be able to make good choices when you're faced with trade-offs, lists, it turns out, presents some actually really interesting uh, performance trade-offs, even in, though they, the two implementations of the same list interface that we're going to produce between today and next week are actually gonna have different performance characteristics uh, for certain operations, which is really interesting. All right, and then usually, you know, again, when we talk about algorithm analysis, we're usually interested in talking about it when problems get very big, not only so that's kind of what reveals the fundamental underlying behavior of the algorithm. Some algorithms might have like a big setup phase, right? So imagine my algorithm has like a big phase where it has to do all sorts of like small pre-computations and things like that, and then it goes into this massive loop, right? Well, if I run it with the small input, all that stuff that it does first might end up taking up a lot of time. But as the inputs get larger and larger and larger, if that loop is looping through the entire input, eventually, more and more and more time that the program spends, that my algorithm spends, is gonna be in that loop, and it's gonna reveal itself to be an ON algorithm, right? So at the beginning, I might be fooled by the fact that there's some constant time steps, but once I make it really, really big, then I see the limiting behavior of the algorithm, and it becomes more clear what kind of algorithm I'm looking at. Okay, good. And then the, the way that we're going to do this, for now, you guys will, you know, uh, be exposed to more sophisticated approaches to doing this in the future, but what we're gonna do um, in 125 this semester is try to put things into categories. 
based on how their performance is related to their input, right? Um, and to do this, we use this idea of big O notation, right? Um, so essentially, big O notation allows us to categorize, okay? To put into categories the limiting behavior of a particular algorithm, right? As its inputs get really big, right? And then here's our favorite graph where we look at the different types of limiting behavior. So, you know, essentially, slowness, you can think of slowness is on, or the time it takes the algorithm to complete is on the y-axis, and the size of my input is on the x-axis. And again, you see huge differences here, right? You know, I've got algorithms down here, like constant time algorithms, which are not very realistic, but, you know, all log n algorithms can sometimes solve problems. It really depends on what the problem is, right? They're way down here. They're barely growing at all as the number of elements increases. Whereas, the, you know, the ON factorial algorithms are, you know, taking off like they're going to Mars, right? They're taking off like a spaceship. So they get very, very slow, very, very quickly. These algorithms down here, the nicer ones, get slow much more slowly. So you can imagine, you know, again, think about the, think about the difference in height. So imagine I take a problem of a certain size. Imagine I'm Google and I have some massive amount of data that I've collected about you that I want to sort or something like that, right? And imagine that I can move it from being O n log n to O n, or from O n squared to O n log n. The speed up is gonna be the difference at a particular point between these two lines, right? So even for 20 elements, you can see I'm already seeing over a factor of three speed up between an O n square and an O n log n algorithm looks like a factor of four, right? So it made, this really does make a difference, you know? This is the difference between, you know, something on your computer taking, you know, running like that, and it being the kind of thing where it's like, well, you better go out and get a cup of coffee. You know, the deep learning algorithms I was talking about before that have really uh, benefited from recent advances in algorithms, they still take a long time to run. Right? So you read about people training these data sets, it still takes hours and hours, if not days, on really fast machines. And this is with the better algorithms. So imagine how long it took with the slow algorithm, right? It was like, oh, I'm gonna train my deep learning uh, data set, I'm gonna go on vacation while it finishes, I'll be back in three years, right? It's not that useful, right? It's like, what are we doing this for? So that we can identify a cat in a photo. Okay, maybe it needs to run a bit faster than that to be useful. All right. So what we started having you guys work on the homework problems is this general data structure called a list. And this is a great starting point for us when we talk both about data structures and algorithms, okay? A list builds on top of something you already understand. You've already seen arrays. Remember, arrays are a data structure. Arrays put items in order, right? Every data structure adds structure to data. I had a bunch of unordered objects, I put them into a list, now they're in order, right? Now there's this additional piece of metadata, the index, that I've associated with every element, right? And these, and, and arrays are tremendously useful. But Java arrays have these irritations, particularly if you have programmed in Python or uh, JavaScript or languages that make it easier to work with ordered data. So a lot of those modern languages, um, have a data structure as known as a list. So a list is like an array, um, except that you can, you know, you can get and set values in it just the way you do with an array. And the notation is the same. Now in Java, the notation is not the same, okay? In Java, we're gonna have to use get and set on a list object. And this is due to limitations that Java has with the language, right? In C++, I think you can do operator overloading maybe. Can you do that in C++ with the bracket? Square brackets, does anybody know this? Anyway, maybe you can, but the point is that in Java, the syntax for using a list is gonna look a little different. Rather than using my square brackets to access an element, I'm gonna actually call a function. I'm gonna do dot get, and then I'm gonna pass the index. If I wanna set something, I can't just do array bracket notation index equals whatever. I have to say array dot, or list dot set, pass the index and the new value. Okay, so it's a little bit more explicit what's going on here. These are functions that I'm calling, right? But I can also do all this other cool stuff, right? So for example, I can add and remove values from any uh, place in the list. 
So I can put values in the middle, I can put them in the front, I can put them in the end, right? Um, and lists are tremendously useful. So, so here's an example, right? A practical problem that becomes extremely irritating to solve with an array, but is trivial to solve with a list. So imagine you're reading data from a file. Do you guys know what a file is? Anybody still heard of a file? Anyone think they know what a file is? I'm not being facetious. Like, you know, yeah, see, I'm not sure you know what a file is either. Well, a file is something that stores data on your computer, right? Somewhere on your computer, even when you turn it off, there's a piece of data, uh, it has a name, and inside that file, there's a sequence of bytes, right? And you can interpret those in different ways. Um, let's imagine that we're interpreting them as, as a series of lines of text. And imagine that file has data in it, like about the population of champagne uh, in each given year going back to 1870 or something like that. And imagine I want to read that file and then do something like compute the average size of champagne or how much the population has increased or what the rate of growth has been over different time intervals or whatever. Um, but here's the thing, when I open the file and I start reading in lines, I don't know how many lines are in the file, right? So in Java, with arrays, what we would have to do is we'd have to say, okay, I'm gonna read everything in once to count the number of lines in the file, and then I can create an array of the right size, and now I'll actually read my data in. But that's really, that's really irritating. What I wanna be able to do, and what I can do with the list, is just create an empty list, and then start reading data in from the file, and every time I get a new piece of data, just push it at the end of the list. So this is something that's actually really useful, and this is one of the reasons why lists are now a feature that's built in to a lot of new programming languages and being something that's being added to existing ones. When you guys get to 225, you guys will do a lot of work with vectors, which are basically lists. A different name, but they have very similar behavior. Okay, so, and, and this is also a chance for us to see trade-offs here, because again, we're going to use the notion of an interface, which we just introduced, right? We're gonna create two different implementations of a list that behave identically, okay? They're gonna implement the same interface. So if I give you one, you don't even know which one it is. It could be one kind of list, it could be another kind of list. It works the same way. But behind the scenes, what we're gonna see, there's some really interesting trade-offs here, right? Um, lists are where we're gonna start looking at this. We'll come back and look at this idea again later, okay? So there's really two different types of lists that we're gonna look at, okay? First one that we'll look at, uh, you guys have been working on, that we'll look at some code for today, is something that in Java is known as an array list. How many people have used ArrayList before in Java? Okay, pretty common, yeah. If you've taken AP, you've probably worked with, with ArrayLists. So ArrayLists are a list, or, an ArrayList is a list, and internally an ArrayList stores items in an array. What you guys have been implementing on the homework is an ArrayList. It's not the same as the way that Java implements it, the one that you get for free with the Java standard library, but it's, you know, it's not uh, too dissimilar, okay? And ArrayLists have the following trade-offs. So in ArrayList, it is fast to look up an item. So get and set are fast. And I'll show you why in a minute. We're gonna actually look at the code for them and you can see exactly why they're fast. Because they utilize this property that if I have a fixed size array, looking up an item, indexing that array is constant time. Okay, so constant time lookups for my ArrayList. But adding, removing to an ArrayList is slow. This is O-N in the size of the list. So modifications and access, constant time. I can get and set elements, constant time, in an array list. If I want to start adding stuff, then things become more complicated. Now I can get to ON behavior. And I'll show, again, we'll show you why. Right, you guys are writing this code, right? So you can see exactly where the N and the ON comes from. You can see the loop that you have to write in order to get this to work. At the end of today's class, we'll go over another way of implementing lists that uses linking, object references to link items together. Link lists not only take up more space than array lists, which is not something we're gonna talk about at length, but they have different trade-offs. So looking up an element in a linked list can be slow. That can be O-N. But adding items to a linked list, particularly adding them to certain positions, the general case of inserting an item into a linked list is also O-N, but there's some special cases that are constant time. And those special cases turn out to be significant because those special cases turn out to match common ways that we use lists. Okay, so this is our big trade-off here. Again, same interface, right? So if I give you a list, 
you can use it identically, regardless of whether it's array list or a linked list. Has anyone ever used linked lists in Java before? Okay, so there's actually a linked list class in Java. A lot of people don't use it, and a lot of people don't understand how to use lists in Java to the point that I've had colleagues be like, oh, why well, I always just use an array list reference, and I'm just like thinking, you should take my class, right, because that's not the way to do it, because there's lots of different ways to implement a list. Okay, well, we'll that'll make more sense in a minute. All right, and again, these present a little bit of di different memory usage trade-off as well. The linked lists are less efficient when it comes to memory. Okay. So here is the actual Java list interface. Okay, now I do not want to frighten anybody. Um, well, okay, actually one thing that we can see here, right, is that whenever you look up an interface in Java doc, it'll tell you all the classes it knows about that implement that interface, and we can see some of the ones we've just been talked about. So here's an array list, and here's a linked list. There's also something called a vector in Java, right? Um, there's something called a filtered list, I don't know what that is. There's a copy on write array list, that sounds interesting. So these are all different implementations of this interface. Meaning that if I give you uh, a reference to a list, you can use it identically. This is what's so cool about interfaces, regardless of whether it's a stack, you know, a array list, a vector, or whatever. Okay? All of these classes are implementations of the list interface. Now, there's a couple of problems with, with Java's list interfaces. The, the reason why we're not using it, you guys can read about it. Actually, there's a lot of useful uh, stuff in here, right? Um, but the Java list interface has a lot of convenience methods in it that I don't want to implement, okay? Um, it's also what's called a generic interface. When you see this syntax, we will come back and talk about that in a couple weeks. Right now, that's not going to make a lot of sense. But we will talk about generics in Java. That's the third kind of polymorphism, actually, that we're going to look at this semester. Okay, but, but that's not gonna make a lot of sense for you for now. So here is our list interface, the simple list interface. All right, and this is what you guys will be working with on the homework, if there's quiz questions on this, which there will be, um, and in class, okay? So, and, and this really is kind of like the, a distillation of just the minimum things that a list has to be able to do to be useful. Okay, so let's go over this together. So I have get and set, right? I promised, like I said, because lists in Java are objects, I can't use bracket notation, okay? The bracket notation in Java, the square brackets, I can only use for arrays. Other languages, you know, uh, relax that limitation, but in Java, if I have bracket notation, I have to have an array. It's too bad, because if I could, I could, if I could force my, my list to look a little bit more like arrays, then maybe be, they'd be more useful, or they'd be easier to transition to. But the fact is, if I want to use a list, I have to replace my bracket notation with get and set, okay? Then down here, I've got, so, you know, get takes an index and returns an object. I'm gonna create this list so I can store any type of object in it. And then I've got my set method as well, okay? So my set method takes an index and an object reference. Now this is another time for us to kind of review a little bit about references, right? So why do these take and return an object reference. This allows me to store any type of data in my list. My list can store strings, integers, all, you remember those primitive type wrappers we quickly talked about last time? Any type of Java object, I can stick it to this list, which is kind of cool, right? Okay? All right, so, so I've got to get and set. Those are the methods that I pulled over from the array. And then the two things that arrays don't have, and then size, right? Size is the other one that, that arrays have. Here, size is a method, not a property, right? So it's more like a string with dot length. Here are the two ones that, you know, are, are more interesting uh, for lists. This is what lists add to an array. I can add an object at any index, okay? And I can remove an object in any index. So I can stick a new element into the list, which causes the size to increase by one, and I can put it at the front, I can put it at the very end, I can put it anywhere in the middle, okay? And then I can also remove an item from the list. When I add an item, I need to pass a reference to the object that I want to add. When I remove an item, I receive a reference to the object that was removed. I don't have to use that. Maybe I just want to throw the object out of the uh, list entirely, but as a convenience, the remove method passes back the reference to the object that was removed, okay? All right, so let's look at a little bit of the starter code that we gave you guys for, um, for the homework problems. And I think this actually has a solution to the, one of the homework problems you guys had to do um, 
yesterday, okay? Um, it doesn't have add on here because that's what you guys are working on now. Um, but it turns out remove and add are quite similar, all right? So this, as I promised, so here's my interface, right? And here's my implementation. This class is called simple array list. This is our first array list implementation. And as promised, it stores the objects in the list in an array. Here is the array that I'm gonna use internally. It's a reference to an array of objects. Now, I haven't created it yet because I don't know how big it has to be, all right? Um, but this is the, internally the reference that I'm gonna use to an array to store my, my uh, objects. And you'll see get and set, right? Well, how do they work, right? I've made this private because I don't want somebody else to access it. I'm gonna force them to use get and set to access the items in the array. So let's look at the get and set functions here first, since these are the ones that are easiest to understand. Okay, so I've got some checking here, right, where I'm basically checking to make sure that my index is valid, okay? So if the index is negative or it's greater than or equal to the length of the array, remember an index that's the equal to the array dot length is one past the end of the array. The last valid index for an array of length n is n minus one, okay? So if I've got a, if you pass me a bad index, I return null. That's true for both get and set. Now, set doesn't return anything, so if you pass me a bad index, set just doesn't do anything. This is not really the right way to handle these problems, but we'll talk about this again later when we talk about exceptions. But for now, if you give me a bad index on add, um, on get, I'm gonna return null. If you give me a bad index on set, I'm just gonna fail silently, okay? So that's just, these are just input checking. Remember, always check your inputs. Make sure your inputs are sane. So by the time I get to line 23 or line 29, I know that my index is good. And then, it's one line of code, right? Here, I'm just gonna return whatever reference is stored in the array at that index. Here, I'm gonna change the reference in the array at that index to whatever reference was passed. Okay, I can store null references in the array if I want to. If you pass me set index i element null and the array has at least one element, then that's gonna succeed, okay? But this, remember, trade-offs here between the time it takes to complete these operations for these two lists. So this, if you remember last time, we talked about constant time operations. So looking up or changing an element in a Java array is constant time, okay? So I've got a constant time check here, and then a constant time operation, a constant time check here, and a constant time operation. What I have are, what I can see here, by looking at the code, is that get and set are constant time operations with an array list. Any questions about this before I go on? Somebody had their hand up here, and then maybe they were just stroking their hair. All right, all right, so this makes sense. Okay, let's go down now and look at um, well, let's look at the constructor here, okay? So what does my constructor do? My constructor um, takes a reference to an array, okay? So this is a way to create a list from an array. You give me an array, this could be empty, it could have references in it. You give me an array of references to objects, and I will create a list. And so what happens here? So essentially what the constructor does is it says, okay, my array, let me scroll up a little bit here, my array needs to have the same size initially as the array that you passed. So here I'm gonna set my array to be an array of object references that's the same size as whatever array that you passed. I put this under a check to make sure that array's not null, right, which is I need to do uh, to prevent you from passing me a bad, bad input. Again, there's better ways to handle this, but we'll, we'll get there. Now I go through the array that you passed, and I just copy the references over. So when I'm done, my array has the same references as the array that you passed, okay? Now again, my array's private, you can't get at it. And in fact, if you're the user of a list, you don't even know that there's an array in there, right? I'm gonna show you, you know, again later today or on, on, on Wednesday, a totally different way to implement lists where there's no array. But for now, We've got one, we have a private array. This is an array list. It implements lists by storing things in an array. 
What kind of copy am I doing here, by the way? Remember I had two different types of, of ways to copy things. You're giving me an array of object references. What kind of copy am I doing? Yeah. It is, in fact, a shallow copy. So I'm copying the references from your array into my array. So if you make changes to those objects later, my array is gonna reflect those changes. You and I have two sets of references to the same object. But there's no new, do you see new being called? If you don't see new, or if new's not being called somewhere, no new objects are being created. If no new objects are being created, um, you're usually doing a, a shallow copy. Now, to do a deep copy, I'd actually have to figure out a way to clone or copy all of the objects that you pass. Okay, that's not what I'm doing. Okay, any questions about this before we go on and look at the good stuff? Okay, so, so far, this is pretty basic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, would I ever give you a quiz question where you had to re-implement the entire list interface? Or sorry, an entire array list. What do you guys think? Sounds like fun, actually. We should just do a whole quiz, just this question. No, I mean, we, we may give you like one of the functions to implement. Yeah, but we never give you the whole thing. It's too much. Yeah. All right, so let's look at remove. Okay, so now you can already see here, right? I mean, look at remove. You know, add was, sorry, get was four lines of which three were error checking. Set was four lines of which three were error checking. Remove is not four lines. Remove's got some meat to it. So let's go through this carefully, okay? And here's where array lists start to, the array in the array list starts to cause a problem, okay? So, so here's, what I, here's what I need to do. Okay, and I'll, I'll just try to use an analogy here to help you guys out. Imagine I have a row in this auditorium that's full of people, and I want to take somebody out of the middle. Now, because of how my arrays work, I need to essentially, because of how I'm storing the list, in order to finish the job, I need to end up with an array that has one fewer element. And that means that I'm gonna have to ask everybody in the row or half the row, or some number of people in the row to shift down, right? So if I imagine I take somebody out of the middle, I take the people to the right of them and say, can everybody move to the left one seat? Um, they all have to do that, and now I've created some space at the end, and I can essentially copy my array into a new array that has a size of one small, right? Let me ask another question. Why couldn't I just leave the null reference there? So here's another way to implement remove. Let's just, instead of, removing the element and actually making the array smaller, let's just set that index of the array to null. Would that work here? I mean, maybe it would, and then we could get rid of all this code. We still have to deal with add, but at least removal would be a little bit easier. Who can tell me what is a problem with that? So again, I'm gonna get rid of this code. All I'm gonna do is whatever you pass in as the remove index, I'm just gonna say, let's just do this. You know, again, this is like way too much work. Let's say array remove index is equal to null return. It seems like it's a lot easier. What's the problem here? What did I, what did I essentially do? I haven't really implemented remove. What have I implemented? Yeah. Yeah, so null is a value that I'm allowed to stick into my array. Okay, I can put null values into my array list. So let's go down here and go back to, let's look at the example code here. So my example code is creating a new list of integers. Let's put a null value in there. I can do that. Nulls are a valid value to insert into my array list. So if I, if instead of removing the value, I set it to null, I'm essentially doing a set, right? There's no difference between remove and set at that point. I'm just changing the value of that index, right? So, so in order to get remove to work, I actually am gonna have to shift everything over, right? This also makes sense, right? So imagine that I remove a value, right? Imagine I have this array and I remove the value at the first index. In fact, let's do that, right? Okay, 
So now let's do simple list.remove zero, and then I'll go through and I'll print it again. Let me put a, a little statement in here just to separate the two so we can see what's going on. Okay. And actually, let's, for fun, let's put, put a, let's put the uh, index in here so we can see what the value is at each index. Okay. So this is, this is what we want remove to do. If you, if you read the official Java list documentation, and this is how our list works as well. Remove should actually take the value out, and the result is that all the other values shift over, okay? So I started with a list where the first element was one, the second element was null, the third element was two. I removed zero. So not only is one gone, but I've modified the indices of these, these values. So everything shifted over to the left, right? So now null has value zero and two has, sorry, null has index zero and two has index one. Okay, so this is what I wanted to have. So now let's go through how remove actually works. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because it's very similar to app, which you guys are working on. Okay, so what do I need to do for remove? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna check my, as always, I'm gonna check my inputs. So I'm making sure that my remove index is valid, okay? Now this is a place, you know, so, so people usually when they implement add, they will use remove as a starting point. That's fine, but it is not the same. There are some subtle changes. This is one of them. I'll just call this out, just in case people get stuck here. Um, this check is a little bit different when you're adding a new value, and you might want to think about why. Okay, but for remove, it's fine. Essentially, I can't remove an item unless the index refers to an item that's already in the list, okay? So, and if, again, if I don't, if you give me a bad index, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fail and not do anything, right? So let's see here what happens if I remove index four, nothing happens, right? If I remove index negative one, nothing happens, okay? If I remove a valid index, now something happens, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I need to get the value out. So I'm gonna return a reference to the value that's being removed, and so here I just grab that right away, okay? So now I've got it, and I have a reference to it, and I don't have to worry about what comes next, right? This is what I'm going to return, right? If you go down to the bottom here, I'm returning this value called to return. Here's where all the interesting stuff happens, though, okay? Is in between. So the first thing I'm gonna do, so remove is going to reduce the size of the array by one. So my array referred to an, L, to, to an array of size n, the new array that I'm going to move the elements into only needs to have a size of array length minus one. So I create a new array, and now what I have here, and this is tricky, you know, you guys should ask on the forum, we can, we can talk about this. This is essentially a two, a two index loop. I'm keeping two indices. One index is into the array that I'm copying from. That's the array that's the part of the object class. That's dot array. The other index is into new array. So original index, is to my original array, and new index is to my new array, okay? Now here's the thing. I need to copy, if my original array had n references in it, I need to copy n minus one of them into my new array. The tricky part here is figuring out which one to skip, because there's one that I need to skip because that's the one I'm removing. So I go through here, and here's my check. I basically say, if the index that I I'm about to copy is the index that I'm trying to remove, bump my original index forward one. Okay, and you, you, you can think about why this works. Okay, so it's like, when I get to the point where I'm about to copy something that I wanna skip, I move my original index forward one. Here, I just keep doing a copy. So I say new array, new index is equal to array, original index, and I keep doing this. Let's put a little bit of code in here, just so you guys can see how this is working. So let's do, Original index, well, I'll do it in the same order as it is below, okay? So here's the place where I'm doing, I'm actually doing my 
my work, okay? So down here, in my remove step, you can see the first time I come through the loop, I copy zero to zero. That's because that item is ending up in the same place. The second time I come through here, I'm copying one to two. Sorry, two to one. So I'm skipping one. Why am I skipping one? Because one is the index that I was asked to remove. If I made the array longer, let's put some more items in here. Three, five. All right, now you can see that that pattern continues. So until I get to the index, I'm just copying things over in the same position that they were. Once I get to the index that I want to remove, I jump forward in my original array, and now I'm copying from one past the position into the new array. Okay. So again, my original array looks like what I would expect with the null value removed. All right, any questions about this before we? I know you guys have been looking at objects for like a month and haven't seen any code like this for a while, so I suspect your brain is probably hurting, but here we are. That's good stuff. Any questions about this before we move on? Okay, so you guys get to do a variant of this today or yesterday. Uh, some of you probably already done. Um, but let's go look at our code. So again, we wanna, what we're gonna be doing between today and Wednesday is we're gonna be comparing these two different ways to implement a list. One using arrays, the other using linking. Let's go back and look at the code. So get and set, you know, I, I'm not saying that you should always look at code in order to answer this kind of question. But if you have some code to look at, you might as well start building an association between features of the code and the complexity classes. So in get and set, I've got no loops. All I'm doing is doing an array lookup. That in Java is a constant time operation. So these two operations are constant time. Now look at remove, okay? So now remove's a little bit more interesting, right? I've got a check here, it's constant time. This is a constant time operation. Where does on come in here? Why is remove on? I've got a loop. Yeah, exactly. So starting on line 43, I have a loop. And the loop goes through the entire array. There are no break statements, there's no return. You know, I'm always, regardless of where the element is, I'm always copying the entire new array, right? If it's at the beginning, I skip something at the beginning. If it's the end, I skip something at the very end. But I always have to go through and essentially rebuild my new array by copying everything from the old array. When you guys finish add, you're gonna see that add's quite similar. All right, so these are on. All right. Now, I just feel obligated to point out the fact that they're all, this is the simplest possible version of this, okay, as befits the class that you guys are in. There are all sorts of cool, clever ways to make this stuff faster. And a lot of them essentially trade off performance for space. So imagine I, instead of, so, so here's a problem here, right? The problem is that every time I remove, I essentially have to allocate this new array and then copy everything into it, right? Uh, it turns out that particularly if I can make ads faster by just keeping an array that's bigger than I need. And then I don't need to do that uh, step of allocating the new array, right? So essentially, and this is how some implementations of lists work, right? When you start out, even if the list only has four elements, it has space for like 32. And then when you get to 32, if you add a bunch of new elements, it's like, oh, okay, well now I'm gonna get like 100, space for 128. And then when you get to 120, it's like, oh wow, things are getting bad now, I'm gonna get space for 1,000. 1,024, you know, it might keep doing this, right? Um, so this, this helps, this doesn't mean that we just don't have to copy things around internally, uh, but not having to reallocate the, the memory is gonna help, because that takes time in Java. Okay, so any questions about array lists? Done with array lists. I'm gonna briefly introduce link lists and then we'll come back to this on Wednesday. But any questions about a list that stores values in an array? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, if you've used array lists in Java, you've been able to tell Java what type of object's supposed to go in that list. We will get there. Okay, this is kind of an advanced feature of Java that I don't feel super comfortable talking about until a little bit later in class. But we are gonna talk about generics and we will use them, yeah. So by the time you guys are done, you will be able to build a list that 
only is it, it can only store one type of object essentially, and that's useful in a lot of places because it allows you to do better error checking. Yeah, so this is Java generics. This is one of the things I don't like about Java is that when you when you if you want to use something as simple as a list, you have to kind of essentially mess around with generics, which are which are somewhat complicated. Um, but there it is. Yeah, but we'll get there. Yeah, great question. Other other questions. Okay, so let me introduce our second competitor in the list competition, which is something called a linked list. So again, array lists are useful. A lot of people use them, they're built into Java, but linked lists are also useful. Linked lists get used all over the place. They get used deep in the bowels of the operating system that runs on your computer. They get used in a lot of really performance critical applications, so they're really interesting uh, to think about, okay? So remember, my goal with the list is to take items and put them in order. That's the structure that a list brings to data. An array allows me to do that, because an array allows me to index it, and by using that index, I'm bringing order to things, right? I put things in order. But here's another way of putting things in order, okay? Here's an example class called item. This class can store a, and this class stores two things. It stores a reference to any object, okay, that's the data, and then it has one piece of structure. It knows what the next item in the list is, okay? Only two things here, right? A reference to an object, that's the data, just like an array list had uh, an array of object references, a linked list has items that can store references to objects, so that's good. And then I have a reference to an item. This is actually our first example of a recursive data structure, where the data structure definition depends on a reference to itself, okay? So then I have a reference to another item, and the reference is called next. That reference is to the next item in the list. So an item in a linked, in this type of list does not know what its index is. It only knows two things. Here's my piece of data, and here's the next item in whatever list you're working, okay? And here's how I can use this to create a list. So essentially, I can start off by creating a list. I hold a, I'm holding a reference to an item. That's a reference to the start of my list, okay? And at the beginning, I create a new uh, list by basically putting an integer into the list and setting the next item to null. So this list now has one value. Okay? It has this item that has a reference to null. If I want to add an item to it, here's how I do that. All right, this, this, gets, tr this gets tricky, okay? So here, here's how we're gonna talk through the right side of this expression. I'm creating a new item. The object that the item holds a reference to is an integer eight, and the next item is whatever items points to when this starts to be evaluated. So when I started evaluating this, items pointed to the item with value zero. When I finish evaluating it, it holds a reference to this newly created item. So again, now I have two items that I've put in order. And I can keep doing this, right? So now I have three items that I've put in order. I have a reference to the first item in the list. That item has a reference to the next item in the list. That item has a reference to the next item in the list. None of these items knows where it is in the list. There's no index as part of my item class. It just knows two things. Here's my data, and here's the next item in the list, if there is one. If there's not a next item in the list, if I'm the last item, then my item, my next reference is null, okay? And so what we're gonna start to do on the homework, um, you know, next week is start to work with this class, okay? So here's one thing I, I, I wanna point out. Our implementation of the simple linked list class is gonna use this um, inner class feature. We talked about this really briefly. I just wanna make sure this doesn't scare anybody, okay? My class simple linked list that eventually is gonna implement all of the same methods that are part of the list interface that my array list class implemented, internally it uses a, this, this class called item. Now this is not a class that anybody else needs to know about. It's only used by the simple linked list implementation. And so rather than having it in a separate file or at the top level, 
I'm gonna put it inside my simple linked list class declaration. This is something called an inner class. They don't work any different than other classes in Java, except for the fact that other classes that might try to use my class don't necessarily, I, I can prevent them from having access to this class, okay? So again, I can do this, you know, this is an inner class, um, it's not scary, you know, it's just like another class, it just happens to be declared in a different place. Okay. Um, oh, and I can also, um, so inner class methods have, so okay, so this is, this, this is important. An inner class method can access variables in its enclosing class even if they're private. So if I have code inside my item, I can access private members from the simple link, link list class. Okay, so this is kind of, a, kind of important. All right, so I don't know why I have this, oh, okay, so let's talk about, you know, uh, and, and this, this code works fine, right? In our playground, you know, this, this will compile and run, and we and we can do stuff with it, right? Okay. So now let's let's start looking at some actual code for different operations that we might want to do on a linked list, right? So so again, this this is going to be this process is going to be more incremental, right? Working with linked lists. We're introducing them today. You guys are gonna see just a peek at it. We'll come back and talk about these on Wednesday. You guys will see them on some homework problems next week. Um, but I, I recognize that this is, I, th I think, a more complicated concept for people to deal with, mainly because it involves linkage and working with references in ways that are gonna strengthen your understanding of references, even if they're gonna feel a little bit unfamiliar and strange at first, okay? So, and, and the other thing is, too, it's actually gonna take us a little while to get to the point where we can implement the full list interface. We're gonna have to start small. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna implement something called add to front, right? Add to front does what it, its name implies. This is a special case of add. Eventually, you guys will do the full case of add and remove. But the special case of add at the front of the list is easier. So that's where we're gonna start. Okay, so let me go back and look at my list interface. So the only thing, so this is the thing that's cool about my simple linked list. Remember my array list stored an array of object references internally. The only thing my simple linked list needs to know is where does the list start? So internally, the only thing that it stores, it defines this new class that it's gonna use to wrap the data that gets put inside of it, but the only piece of information that you need that the class has to maintain is this one piece called start. Start is a reference to the first item in the list. Because if I can find the first item, then I can find the next item. And if I find the next item, then I can find the item after that. This is the beauty of linked lists. I don't need an array to store a reference to every object in the list. Instead, I store the structure within those objects themselves. So every item stores part of the list structure, it stores the next reference. So imagine, you know, I talked before about, you know, the array list is sort of like a bunch of people sitting side by side, you know, in one of these blocks of chairs. A linked list would be like if I gave each person or every person that's part of the list the name of the next person in the list. So I could start it somewhere in the auditorium and I could say, okay, um, you know, who's the next person in the list? And you give me a name and I would find that person, maybe they're up in the balcony, I would go to them and say, okay, who's the next person? I can do that. And I can use that to create a list with as many items in it as I want, okay? All right, let's come back here and start up here on Wednesday. I think this is a good stopping point even though um, I didn't get as quite as far as I wanted to, that's fine. Um, so the MP3 early deadline is this week and good luck with that um, on your deadline day, whatever that is. And I will look forward to seeing you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.